Hi everyone. Today we're going to be learning a bit more about the motor effect and in particular how to construct a motor. This of course is one of the most important applications of the motor effect. So we're going to be starting off talking about DC electric motors. DC of course means direct current. So current that's a constant steady flow such as what might come from a battery. Later on in the module although not for a while yet, we'll be looking at how to make electric motors with AC, alternating current. Now, we can use the motor effect in order to build an electric motor, right? So, what is an electric motor? It's a device that continuously transforms electrical energy into kinetic energy. That means that if we put a constant supply of electricity in, it'll give us a constant supply of kinetic energy out, right? I'm sure we can see that this could be very useful. It's constructed from a number of different components. We can see that this simple electric motor in the diagram has lots of different parts to it. So, let's go through them. First of all, we need a static magnetic field, right? The motor effect requires that we have a field before we can get anything moving. So how do we create a magnetic field? Well, we're going to need magnets. So we get a pair of magnets. These, pair, these uh, magnets don't move, right? They're static. So we call them stators. And finally, we need a wire coil uh, in the field. We know from our studies on torque and the motor effect that in this situation, when the current flows through the coil in one direction, it will start to rotate. Right? So that's what the armature is for. We can, of course, put it on an axle, just straight across. Right? That'll let it spin around. Now, if we pass a continuous current through the coil, then as we've seen, we'll get the coil going through one quarter of a full rotation and then stopping. Because the forces on it look something like this. The force on the top wire of the coil is pulling it up, and the force on the bottom wire of the coil is pulling it straight down. This means that the net torque on the coil is zero, because we're pulling away from the axis of rotation. So to keep it going, what we need to do is figure out a way to reverse the force on it. So just as the wire gets to the top here, we need to make the force that's currently pulling it up start pulling it down instead. Right? That means that once it's past its vertical position, its momentum will sort of carry it forward a bit and then it will be pulled back around the other way. And this is how we construct the electric motor. All we need now is a way of reversing the current. And we can reverse the current with a device called a split ring commutator. Right? So a commutator is something that uh, commutes electric current from one thing to another. And a split ring has to do with the shape of this particular commutator. Let's take a look at it. So here's a diagram of a split ring commutator. What we have is a conducting ring in the middle here, and we can see that it's split into two halves, right? One here and one here. So each part of the commutator is connected to one of the armature's terminals, and these are these little wires coming out here. But what are these little objects on the side? Well, they're devices which allow us to pass electric current into the commutator without stopping the commutator from turning, right? So the split ring will just continue to rotate on its axis while these devices are passing current to it. So we call these uh, devices that connect the commutator to the external current brushes because they brush against the surface of the commutator, right? The conducting brushes are able to carry current into the commutator so that electric current can flow through the brush and then into the armature, right? Remember that the armature is the name that we give to the coil that spins in the magnetic field. 
So brushes are a clever little way of managing to transfer electric current into the armature without stopping the electric uh, armature from spinning, right? So this is, as you can see, a very useful device. We have a photograph of it over here. There are two brushes in this picture, one to the left of the set of coils in the middle and one to the right. So the brushes are able to slide over the commutator but are not fastened to the commutator. I'm sure that you'll agree that this is quite important. If they were fastened to the commutator, they'd sort of get tangled up, right, as the armature started to turn. Now, brushes are often made of graphite. Graphite is a compound made of carbon, or rather a form of elemental carbon, which is able to conduct electricity. It's often used as a pencil lead, so the little grey bit sticking out of a pencil that you write with is in fact made of graphite. Now, the good thing about graphite is that it's quite slippery, right? When you write with a pencil, the graphite slips off the pencil and that's what leaves the pencil marks. So the graphite is able to lubricate the commutator. That means that the commutator stays slippery and is able to keep spinning without being slowed down by the brushes. So here we have an animation of what happens when we run a direct current across an armature using a set of brushes. So in this case, the brushes will be connecting the external current to the split ring commutator at this point and at this point, right? So we can see that the direct current is transmitted into the coil. We've seen an animation quite similar to this before. So what happens? Well, as we can see, the motor effect causes an upward force to act on the right side of the coil and a downward force to act on the left side of the coil. And this pulls the coil into a vertical position. Right? We can figure out that it must rotate because there's a torque acting on it. The torque from the left side of the coil and the torque from the right side of the coil is identical and in the same direction. Right? So it gets all the way up to a vertical position. But what will happen after this? What's happening to the brushes as they go over the split ring commutator? Well, once the commutator reaches the vertical position, the split in it is what's connected to the external current, right? So as the coil reaches its vertical position, the brushes lose contact with the commutator. That means that just as it gets to its vertical position, there is no current running through the armature and it stops experiencing a force. But that won't stop the armature from turning, will it? It'll, its momentum will sort of carry it on. It will go a little bit further than its vertical position. Now at this point, the external current will connect to the other side of the split ring commutator. So what will that mean for the forces on the armature? Well, let's take a look. We can see from this animation here that when the coil turns further than the vertical position, then the external, con uh, the external current coming the other way through the split ring commutator will change the forces that are acting on the coil. So the brushes are now in contact with the opposite terminals of the armature. And you can see that every time the coil reaches its vertical position and the split of the split ring passes over the external current, the current in the armature will change direction, right? You can see that the arrows suddenly change direction at this point. So the new torque uh, that's produced by the external current connecting to the other side of the split ring commutator will be in the same direction as the original torque. In this case, it will be anti-clockwise. Can you see how that works? When the current reverses, it means that the left side is once again experiencing a downward force, and the right side is once again experiencing an upward force. Right? So it, it's always moving in the same direction. This means that now we have a coil that is constantly rotating as long as we can supply it with a constant supply of electrical energy. 
In other words, we have a motor. So the split ring commutator allows the armature to rotate continuously. So the finished motor will continuously take electrical energy that you put into it in the form of electrical current and turn it into kinetic energy, which is the rotational energy of the armature. Remember that if the armature is connected to an axle, it will be turning that axle as well. The axle can then in turn uh, rotate different parts of machinery. So how do we maximize the power of a motor? Well, all we need to do is maximize the torque, right? So how do we do that? We've learned a little bit about torque before and what affects it. And so we should be able to make some pretty good guesses at how we can increase the strength of the motor. We can increase the area of the coil. That is, make the coil longer or wider or both. We can increase the current in the coil, so it's the amount of electrical current passing through it. We can increase the magnetic field strength that moves across the coil, because this will create a greater motor force. Or we can increase the number of loops in the coil. All of these are, of course, represented in our equation for torque. Tau equals N, the number of loops, B, the magnetic field, I, the current in the coil, and A, the area of the coil. There's also a cosine theta, but of course if the motor is rotating, the cosine theta will be constantly changing. So we can see that the equation reflects all the ways that we can increase the strength of the motor. So what do we use them for? Well, we can use them in battery operated toys and tools because batteries, of course, create a DC current. And if we have a DC current, then we can use a DC motor. We can use them for train motors. We can use them in electrically powered vehicles, like golf buggies. And we can use them for things like CD players and other low powered devices. So that's the end of the theory. Uh, now we know a little bit about DC motors and how they manage to turn continuously by the use of a split ring commutator. So let's go on to some questions to check if you've all got that. Question 1. Which of these is not necessary for all DC electric motors? Is it a DC power supply, permanent magnets, an armature, or brushes? Can you see which one it is? The answer is, of course, permanent magnets. In a DC electric motor, we need a magnetic field, right, that constantly passes across the armature. But this magnetic field doesn't need to be created by permanent magnets. We could use electromagnets to create an identical magnetic field. And in fact, this would have the advantage that we're able to control the strength of the magnetic field. And if we want to, we can make it very, very strong. Question two, which of these appliances does not contain an electric motor? Is it a desktop fan, electric egg beaters, computer mouse, or food processor? Now let's think about all of these. A desktop fan has a fan blade that's constantly rotating, so it must be turned by an electric motor. Electric egg beaters have little beaters that of course are constantly turned. The food processor has a whirring blade, once again turned by an electric motor. The only one that doesn't fit the pattern is, of course, the computer mouse. So this is the correct answer. The computer mouse isn't moved by a motor, it's moved by you, right? Unless you have a very fancy mouse. Question three. Outline the purpose of each of the following in a DC motor. So we're going to have a multiple part question here. The first part asks us to outline the purpose of a state or field. Now, what's a stator field? Well, it's stator, so that gives us the clue that it's static. And it's a field. So this must refer to the static magnetic field that passes across the armature, right? So what's it there for? Well, it's there to make the armature rotate with the motor effect, right? 
So the stator field is a magnetic field provided by a pair of permanent magnets or electromagnets as the case may be so that the motor's coil can experience the motor effect. Makes sense, right? All right, part B. Outline the purpose of brushes. So what are the brushes in, ele in an electric motor? Well, remember that when a motor rotates, we don't want wires to get tangled up. So we need a way to supply electricity to the armature without actually being fastened to the armature. And so for that, we use brushes. Brushes are graphite terminals that supply the motor's coil with an electric current, but still allow the coil to turn, right? We use graphite because graphite is slippery, and it means that the uh, armature will be able to keep turning for a long time without replacing the brushes. Question four. Describe how a split ring commutator works. You can all remember this split ring commutator, right? It looks something like a ring that has been split in half, hence its name. So why is it so useful for an electric motor? I'll give you a second to think about it. All right, that's probably long enough. So a split ring commutator is a ring split through the middle so that each side of the ring is connected to a different terminal of the armature, right? So the ring itself is what is fastened to the armature. So current is carried through the commutator to the armature via brushes, right? So the external source of current is connected by brushes to the split ring commutator and the commutator is able to commute that current to the armature, which is what we need the current in if we're going to get any movement. So as the armature rotates, the commutator will supply it with current uh, until the armature reaches its vertical position. And at this point, the split in the split ring commutator is what's closest to the brushes. So when the coil reaches its vertical position, there is no current passing through it. What happens after that? When the rotating continues, uh, the commutator will have current passing through it the other way, right? So that means that the commutator automatically reverses the direction of the current through the coil. Instead of going around one way, it's going around the other way. And this means that uh, in the magnetic field, it'll always experience a torque in the same direction and turn continuously. Question five. Name two disadvantages of a motor that uses DC power and graphite brushes. So that is a DC motor, right? So to answer this, we have to think about some of the disadvantages of DC power and some of the advantages of having brushes that are in constant contact with a moving commutator. All right, so what are some of the disadvantages? DC power. The Australian mains power that's produced in the generators and carried through the high voltage lines is AC power, right? Alternating current. And this means that we can't use it for a DC motor. We can't just plug a DC motor into the mains and expect it to work. We need a way to convert the AC signal into a DC signal. The alternative, of course, is to use batteries, but eventually they'll run dry. What about brushes? Well, we know because, of course, when we use pencils, if we uh, expose graphite to a moving surface, like a pencil to the surface of paper, then some of the graphite will rub off, right? That's how a pencil writes. So if we have a DC motor constantly spinning, some of the graphite brushes are going to rub off onto that split ring commutator, right? So that means that the brushes will wear down over time and eventually they'll have to be replaced. 
So the motor won't work forever. The little graphite brushes will eventually wear down and stop working. Uh, if we manage to find a way of creating a motor without using brushes, then it'll last significantly longer than this sort of DC motor. But as I said, we'll get to that much later in the module. So that's the end of the questions. In this section, we've learned about DC motors. They're constructed, of course, with a static magnetic field, a rotating armature that's connected with a split ring commutator and a set of graphite brushes to an external current. And this allows it to continuously transform electrical energy into mechanical or kinetic energy.